You know, you hear people in grief and they'll say, I'm just not ready for that. We need to let them not be ready. It's okay. Whatever a person in grief decides they're not ready for, we need to allow them and we need to allow ourselves not to go there. You don't have to do that. And so when we give permission for people to grieve, there's real freedom there. One of, one of the ways that we can know that grief is coming to a conclusion, because people say, well, how will I know when I'm out of this grieving period? Will be the time when you are tired of talking about it. You will talk about things, talk about the hurt, talk about the ache, talk about the loss, talk about the separation, and it will go on and on. And you need, that's when we need friends who don't get tired of it, who will listen. And they may get tired of it, but they don't tell us. And so they just, <laughs> yeah. they just, they just listen and listen. They nod. They nod <laughs> and they say, I've heard this before, but go ahead and say it again. But the wonder of it all is the day you wake up and you start to talk about it and it's like, I have no need to talk about it because I've said everything that needs to be said. That's when grief has been expunged. That's when the sorrow has been, the cup of sorrow has been drained. My name is Colleen Spindle Thompson, the director of Reframing Ministry at Insight for Living. And today I am so excited for you to meet someone who you probably already know, Jan Silvis. Jan, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thanks, Colleen. It's great to be here. You've been married for 52 years. You are a mother and a grandmother. You've published 11 books, one of which I love the title is Big Girls Don't Whine and uh -uh. foolproofing your life. You've been traveling a lot as a speaker. You're also a professional life coach. What do you not do? <laughs> I don't cook very well. Okay, <laughs> call out, that works. That? Yeah, exactly, gotta call out. I want everyone who is watching or listening right now to know that this interview is going to be so life transforming if you choose to Take what we discuss and implement into your life. We're going to talk about the circumstances in our lives that God knows, that God cares, and that he will provide as he has promised to. Jan's book is called Courage for an Unknown Season, Navigating What's Next with Confidence and Hope. Get this book if you're at any age. <laughs> It is so, so good. Here are my notes, Jan, just to tell you, I loved it. Jan, what led you to write this book in the first place? Well, I, I hit a season. It was an unknown season, and um, it was when I turned 70, of all things. And I thought, I've never been 70 before. I know people who've been 70, and it didn't look so good. <laughs> and, I thought, and I thought, oh, no. I'm, I'm 70. What am I going to do? And then I thought, this is an unknown season. But then I thought back through the rest of my life, there had been a lot of unknown seasons. And then I thought, well, everybody has unknown seasons and we need to understand how to navigate those seasons. Mm -hmm. So that's what brought me to writing the book. And there was also just a little caveat to there. I have uh, five grandchildren and one of them is a 14 year old boy. And he said to me one day, I wish you'd just write down everything, you know, for us. <laughs> and I That's thought, fabulous. And I thought, okay. And so that was at the time I was thinking about courage for the unknown season. And I thought, well, he's 14 and he's going to have a lot of unknown seasons. Right. And I thought, what can help him just as what can help me as I approach old age? What will help him as he approaches adulthood? And you know, they're all the same things, Colleen. Hmm. They're all the same things. And if we will learn them and embrace them, it will, it'll help us get through. You know, what I want to do, and I hadn't planned on doing this, but some of the chapter titles are so captivating because whether you're 14, 24, 44, 54, 74, 94, whatever, we struggle with learning resilience, with fear, with 
The fact that we forget to laugh and we have lost the song and the melody in our hearts when we go into seasons that we do not think we can make. In fact, you mentioned in the opening chapter, no matter our age, we will walk into situations where we'll need courage to navigate what's coming. One source of courage comes from having the mindset to learn from people who have already walked those roads. What can they teach us? And what can we learn from those coming behind? There is so much to to be learned both ways. And as we had talked before, you mentor a lot of young women and talk about cross mentoring. You learn as much from them as they do from you. Yes. How as a church can we bring the generations together more peacefully instead of I'm in the 20s group, or I'm in the 30s group, or I'm in the 40s group. And we so establish it by generation, separating the wisdom that could come. Absolutely. And that's what we do. And you ask, how can we bring them together? Well, one way is just to bring them together and not isolate, not have a singles group, not have a young marrieds group, not have a seniors group. Because when we isolate like that, then we don't learn from each other and we begin to see each other is really different Mm -hmm. and is really not related to where I am. Mm -hmm. And yet I find that as we as we intermingle with one another and as we spend time with each other, we learn from each other. There is so much I learn from the people who are coming behind because they're living in a different culture than I lived in. And if I'm going to navigate the culture and if I'm going to grow old in a wise way and be able to still communicate with people Mm -hmm. as I age, then I need to know what culture they're living in. I need to know how they communicate. I need to know what bugs them. I need to know what they do not, um, what they're not in tune with, what they think is really old (laughs) fogeyish, And, um, and, and I need to know that so I can communicate just as those who are older. I've seen them, many of them manage with grace, mm. but I've also seen many of them just give up, just mm. sit down and just say, I'm too tired. I'm too old and I'm not doing it. Which and really is it's selfish. Like, it's very selfish because they have so much to give, mm-hmm. but I understand because they're tired and many times they're in pain. And when you have pain, you don't always focus on other people. It usually is about you. So yeah, it's what we need to recognize. Um, how what what would you say if you were to go into meet with your pastor and say, "How can we work on multi generational mentoring?" It's easy to say, "Let's not have these groups," right? But yet we also need some kind of strategy. Yes. And I think I think the church is catching on in their small group mentality and that they're putting together small groups. But the idea would be not to put together people of small groups of the same age. There should yes. always be older, younger, uh, a multiplicity of ages sprinkled in. I teach a class and I teach a class. We have men, women, teenagers, um, people who are. 70, 75, 80, and they're all in this room together. Now, they don't all speak up the same way, but they're Mm -hmm. all hearing each other. When somebody does speak up, they hear each other. I love teaching that kind of class. And I think if we could just encourage pastors that you're not going to lose people when you do that kind of thing, you're not going to lose them. They will come and they will be part of um, they will be part of a group that is just um, it's it's a good group. And and it's a group from which they will learn much. So important. So that is so important. Well, and if anything, they all can fix our electronics. (laughs) And I love that because I, you know, even if I know a little bit, I just play dumb. And I'll say, I just can't make this iPhone work. And and they always know what to do. They do in a snap. And my son goes, Mom, how come you don't know this? I'm like, because I wasn't born into this. That's right. But there are a few things that I may know that you don't. So don't get ahead of yourself. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> I taught you to eat. 
Right. <laughs> <laughs> I provided the roof over your head. Exactly. Let's start there. Um, you cover one of the most profound and important chapters um, of, on resilience because that is fundamentally a make it or break it trait, yes. I, I think. In fact, you say resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, stress, or significant sources of stress and threats, such as family and relationship problems, serious health problems, workplace and financial challenges. It's not called just get over it, but rather something, but rather an encouragement to be as strong as possible in the midst of it. It's almost like Lift, um, it's almost like lifting weights. If yes. we're going to move our muscles and have them be strong, we have to have resistance for that to happen. That's exactly true. That's a great comparison. Tell me what has occurred in your life that, that caused you to find, I've got to cultivate resilience. I think I learned it really at my parents' knees. I learned it from them mm -hmm. because they were uh, very resilient people who did not start out having anything. They, wow. um, they were uh, dirt poor and mm -hmm. they moved to Washington, D.C. without a job. And I can remember when I was two years old that we, my mother and I had come up on the Greyhound bus, met my daddy who was working who was looking for a job, didn't have one. And we moved into one room and I slept on two over stuffed chairs that were pushed together. And as I did that, uh, and we had milk on the windowsill and I remember that well, but I began to see resilience. And what I learned from them is that you can do this and you don't have to have um, you don't have to have things perfectly put together. You can do whatever you have to do. I saw them do whatever they had to do. And one thing they had to do was they had to find work. They had to find a job and they could not continue living where they were living if they were ever going to, um, if they were going to succeed. And so we went to, uh, we, I grew up there. I watched them. And I watched them over the years as they dealt with things. They never got bad attitudes about it. They never got down about it. They never said, poor me. And they didn't allow me to say that. And so I could not live in a learned helplessness, which is the opposite of resilience. Yes. I could yes. not live there. They didn't let me live there. And they taught me not to live there. And so that's where I really learned it. But then as I grew... I could apply it in certain places mm. because there were relationships that didn't work out. There were um, things I wanted to do and I didn't get to do. There were all kinds of um, difficulties that came just with doing life. Now, nothing really dramatic, but life, life's tough. Then you die. That's just a reality. And it so, is. yeah. And so there was that. And, but then I began to deal with them, my parents, as they grew older, they got sick and they died. And as I dealt with them, I saw them die with resilience, die with grace. So I learned a lot really from that path. I was the only child. And so I had to take care of them in their old age. And I learned resilience. I didn't say, oh, I can't do this because they were both, they both had long illnesses and they were a handful to deal with. And they didn't live in my town which made it even more interesting. But um, I think I learned by watching, and I think that's how we teach. We teach mm -hmm. by showing resilience rather than trying to tell somebody this is resilience. So that's my well, that's, story. Well, that's incredible uh, because that involves attitude. That involves a sense of self-confidence. Yes. You can't overcome what you don't believe you can't overcome. Exactly. Um, it involves support from the outside at times, um, embracing change. They moved and there was no job. That's right. quite a change. 
I found there was someone who wrote on three different ways that we can cope with stress. Emotional focused stress or emotionally focused. We can go to a problem problem focused Mm -hmm. or we can go to it through avoidance. And the emotional focused one is the emotions overweigh the person's ability to be disciplined, to have an attitude of of progress, their emotions guide them. Problem focused is problem solving. What skills do I need to solve this problem? Right. And avoidance, of course, is the big ostrich. uh, um, Stick your head in the sand. The head in the sand. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And so have there been times where you have tried and been unsuccessful because emotions were huge? You know, I would have to say that emotions have not been my issue. Um, I I learned how to navigate emotions. Now, sticking my head in the sand (laughs) was probably my issue. Because when your emotions are pretty well under control, then it's easy just not to look. Because you don't want to feel. And so my emotions were under control. I didn't want to feel. So if I just didn't look, stuck my head in the sand, then I didn't have to deal with it. And yes, I would say I have done that on um, more than one, many uh, Mm -hmm. occasions. Uh And it hasn't always come back to bite me because sometimes denial is a great place to live. You can float on it or it can be a river in Egypt. Exactly. Either, (laughs) Either or. But, but I have found that when I have spent time um, drilling down and finding out mm. what's really going on and what, why have I gotten in this mess one more time? Why have mm. I done this? Then I have learned from it. I have become stronger and it has given me something then to share with other people. If I just continue to look away, put my head in the sand, then I have nothing to share. I have learned nothing. I've just learned to escape. And that's what a lot of people do. They just escape. And head in the sand can be food. It can be drink. It can be drugs. It can be, you name it, head in the sand. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. And from that, we learn nothing. What do you say to the person who goes, wow, I I didn't really realize that I've had my head in the sand about where my marriage is, where my child is, where I am in my job. How do they get going? Facing truth. Hmm. And um, they need a truth teller in their lives, but they also have to face it. And for many people, if your head's in the sand, it's hard to face the truth. That's why your head's in the sand. So you have to pull (laughs) your head out of the sand and you have to know that facing the truth will bring good things. It will bring Hmm. hard things, but the truth will set you free. The Lord has told us that. So if the truth sets you free, then there's a bondage when you have your head in the sand. There's a bondage when you're emotionally controlled. And so to live in the truth is to be able to face it for what it is and then to 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 really learn how to navigate it. And I think until you know your head's in the sand, you can't navigate anything. You're not going anywhere. You're just stuck in the same old stuff. And how boring is that? How so you boring. do have to you have to come out with I believe that I cannot face this alone perhaps. Right. But I know the truth says that the Lord will provide a way of escape that right. he will provide what is needed. It's not always the way we want it and it rarely is the way that's comfortable. But it's for a greater purpose, cultivating resilience or as you wrote about fear. It's also about addressing our fears, which is often something we want to avoid. One of the quotes that I loved was, our ability to manage fear is the number one factor in determining how well we will navigate an unknown season of our lives. That was so good. Fear (laughs) doesn't need a real situation. All it needs is a thought. Our fundamental belief in the sovereignty of God and the love of God is the only antidote that we have 
to face the fears of this world. And we're, sh- we're getting hit with a lot of fears right now. Oh, from every side. It's fear, fear, fear. And if there's not fear, then somebody's going to drum up the fear. And so if it's something you haven't thought of, it'll be a new one. And it's like, dear Lord. You know, how do we how do we navigate this world? And thank you, Lord, we're only here for X number of years, and this is not our home. So we are passing through to something better. But while we're here, how do we live um, without fear? I have a friend that was just diagnosed with fourth stage inoperable, incurable cancer two weeks ago. Oh, now, yeah. how do you face that? knowing that there is great fear. And, you know, the words that came to me, she called me from the doctor's office. I was the first person she called. And I thought, dear Lord, how do I respond to this? But the sweetest words came to my mind, and I hope they were a comfort because I said, Sandy, I want you to know, the only." she said, how could this happen? How could this happen? And I said, I just want you to know there's only one thing I can tell you. And that is God is sovereign. And mm-hmm. your last day was planned before you were born. And you're not going to leave one day sooner. And you're not going to leave one day later. And so that's been settled. So now it's just a matter of how you manage what you're dealing with between now and the last day that has already been determined. Because God is sovereign. That means he rules over all. That's all I can tell you. And she got real quiet. And she said, that's truth. And I know it. Mm. And I thought, truth helps our fear. Even though it is a hard truth, it is much easier than living in the shadow lands of untruth and what ifs. And could this be? And could I have done something differently to to make this not happen. We just got to deal with, okay, here's the truth, but here's God's truth. And his truth is always bigger. His sovereignty is always bigger than our stuff. You totally reframed her terminal situation in a way that I was comforted (laughs) by saying, the days have been planned. This is of no surprise to the Lord. Right. But we must find absolute truth from Scripture in order to reframe these kinds of circumstances. It's the only way Um, to to do it, Colleen. It's the only way. Isn't that the way, too, that we realize God does care? He didn't throw this on me because he's mad or because he can't have that in his character. He cares. Or because I've been bad. Right, right. Or I don't have enough faith, or I haven't prayed enough, or I ate right. the wrong chocolate on the wrong night. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Too much fat. I mean, you know, and it just gets down to, wait a minute. God knows. And he and he knew about this before it ever happened. Now, does does he keep us from going through difficult situations? No. But does he ta- say that he will take us through it? Yes. And so on that, we can rely. And our last day is predetermined, so I don't have to dance around trying to extend a life that has already been determined. And there's just something wonderfully comforting about that. There's something wonderfully comforting because it brings us back to God's character. Exactly. He has a purpose in her, in her last days. She will model resilience, exactly. problem-solving, attitude, all those things. Things that that bolster up one's spirit. Right. Or she could choose to, I'm defeated, learned helplessness. Exactly. I can't do anything about this. Poor me. Poor me. (laughs) Another one. Exactly. I think we've both had that party maybe a a few times. We know that word, that phrase. Well, and I also, in dealing with a close, close friend of mine who we've interviewed a couple of times, Michelle Cachat, I remember... She had just gone through her third cancer surgery that was horrible. And I was two days home from having unbelievable back surgery that I thought there can't, it it trumps labor. 
by far. Right. <laughs> it's the worst pain. And we just went back and forth sending jokes to each other, which is why I love the fact that you put laughter in your book. Yeah, it wasn't, oh, poor me. No. <laughs> you said laugh, laughter. We will not make it. We won't. No. There's just always something to laugh at, I think. Yes. You wrote, it's proven that laughter is healing to the body, proven to affect gen geriatrics, oncology, critical care, psychiatry, rehabilitation, ruminology, home care, palliative care, hospice care, terminal care, and general patient care. See, when I go to laughter and the body, as you pulled into this book, I start looking up all kinds of things. There's actually laughter therapy through the National Cancer Treatment Centers of America, exactly. which has, it's amazing. Yes. Um, and then you went into the fact that the brain is so a part of the laughter and the decision-making process. I found the brain can perform, now this is gonna blow your mind because it blew mine, 10 quadrillion processes per second and 60 trillion things to 60 trillion cells every second. It's part of the amygdala. It's part of our subconscious. Right. And the only thing it cannot do is distinguish between a real event and something that is thought about. For example, a nightmare. We have a nightmare and we wake up sweating, uh, all worked up. Heart palpitating. So, when it comes to laughter, how, um, how do you reframe situations that would otherwise be embarrassing, difficult, um, whatever you want to call it, with laughter? One of the things that I have learned is that, first of all, to laugh at yourself, that takes care of the embarrassing because <laughs> when, when you're embarrassed, it is you don't want to be laughed at or someone has laughed at you, if you just join in the laughter and say, well, that's, you know, Klutz, that's me. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> Klutzo's at it again. It just, <laughs> it makes, it makes such a difference and it releases the tension. So you laugh at yourself. But the other thing you do is don't be afraid to laugh with someone who is going through a really tough time. Because it's that laughter that releases the tension in them. I had a friend that was dying. I reference her in the book, Charlotte. And mm. she was a woman full of laughter. Every time I think of her even now, I laugh because she was always, she always had that moment of laughter that just released the tension. And even as she was dying, dying, and I knew she was dying and she knew she was dying, when we would sit and talk, she would bring up the most bizarre things and we would just roll with laughter. I mean, she would bring up, she told me we were sitting, she was in a few weeks of the end and she had this bump on her nose and we were sitting and chatting. She says, you know, I was thinking about having this bump removed and I just looked at her like, you have got to be kidding. And, and, she, and then she just died laughing because of the way I looked and she said, well, Maybe I don't need to. I said, no, I really don't think you need to. And But it was just that she always had that in the mix, which mm. made, she had a, had a pretty unbearable life, but she could mm. always laugh. She lost two sons to accidents. She, uh, her husband had MS. She had had cancer many times and she died at 68. But I'm telling you, the woman laughed until the end. And had she not laughed, I don't know how she could have survived and have left with the grace that she did and left a legacy for all of us who knew her, her family. And what we think of is her <clears throat> laughter, which was always appropriate, but always released the tension in the room. That is really, that is really great. In fact, when you when you brought in Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart does good like medicine, yes. but a broken spirit dries the bones. You pulled in the very fact that to our cellular level, right. where the marrow is made in the bone and the cells are remade every seven years, 
laughter and joy are a part of the cellular process. I had no idea that verse was so profoundly connected to our bodies. I didn't either until I looked it up as I was writing <laughs> this and I thought, oh my goodness, think about that. It's, it is to the very cellular level and our bones will dry up because the marrow is the life where the blood is, the life of the bones. Our bones will dry up if we don't laugh. And that's why you can go to nursing homes and you can find some people who are resilient. They are full of laughter. They, um, they look at their situation and they say, well, this is life. And they find something to laugh about. And they do so much better than someone who is sitting there and their bones have dried up. And I think, dear Lord, keep me from having dried up bones. Let mm -hmm. me laugh. And find a way. <clears throat> well, here are a few things that you may want to laugh at. A woman's mind is cleaner than a man's because she changes it more often. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> or another one I found it is I found was they say marriages are made in heaven, but so is thunder and lightning. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I like that. And there are some things that we have done around our house in raising a child who is disabled that that there's profound grief. There's also profound freedom right. when we choose to use our circumstances, um, when we look at them eternally, and then we find some humor in them. And we forget, I don't care what anyone thinks, because really it doesn't matter. Right, right. It, it, it's, it, it's not something that I have to explain. It's something I right. understand, and God knows, and we're good. And it's amazing. <laughs> then, then you can. There will be things that will happen that would be hilarious to you. Outsiders might look at it and think, "Can't believe you would laugh at that." And yet, for you, it's like if I don't laugh, it's I'm going down. So yes, I lights are laugh. out. That's right. That's right. Um, what are some times where you have found joy in the midst of a really tough time? Oh, um, there, there have been many because I, I laugh easily and that's a gift mm -hmm. that I think God has given me. I just laugh easily. I think when my, my dad was going through severe dementia and was just not the person I had known, he had always mm -hmm. been a, a loving, freewheeling, uh, easily laughing individual and he got mean and difficult and it was just mm -hmm. a painful time, but he would come out with things every now and then that would just be hilarious. And mother and I would just fall over in a heap because he would just come out with it. And one that, one that I remember particularly was we were sitting um, in his room and a young woman had come in and she was for physical therapy and she was working with him. And all of a sudden he said, ethics, E-T-H-I-C-S. <laughs> and I thought, what? And I said, Daddy, what are you saying? He said, ethics. And he spelled it again. And what I began to understand was because he was not communicating that well, mm -hmm. was he did not want this young woman sitting on his bed because of his ethics. Now, where his ethics came from, all of a sudden, I don't know. But there they were. His ethics would not <laughs> permit that. So I suggested that she needed to move away from his bed because his ethics were uh, called into question. And <laughs> I thought it was funny. Mother thought it was funny. And we just laughed. Now, the young girl didn't know what to think, but she'll learn. Um, it's <laughs> she'll funny. learn because there's a lot of decoding that goes on with those who struggle with communication. Exactly. And, you know, he woke up to a new wife every day. Yeah, because <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. We're, str we're struggling with, not struggling, but we are managing through mm -hmm. a loved one very dear to us who is in the later stages of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And I keep saying, you know, he has a new wife every day. Right. Uh, she may swear and he'll forget it the next moment. So <laughs> I'm not encouraging that, but, but it, it may help. Right. It happens. And, 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 and the thing is, if you don't laugh, then you look at it as this is the most awful thing that could happen. And you know, we make things awful. There are awful things, but we make things awful. 
And when we make them awful, we awfulize them in our minds. And then we create this atmosphere of doom and gloom. And it's terrible. We are only on this earth for a short period of time. And yes, there are things that are awful. But if we make them awful, then we have just joined into that sadness and doom. And we can make our lives miserable and everybody around us. Who wants to come around an awfulizer? Who wants to be in the presence of that kind of person? I don't know anybody who does. Well, it's also not biblical in the sense that it's assuming that we know the future. Exactly. When clearly, as you just said, our days are ordained. Right. So why will I worry about something that may not ever come to pass? Exactly. And if it does, if it does come to pass, then I know the God who gives me dying grace for dying days and gives me everything I need for life and godliness. And he means that even up to the last minute of our lives. And he will get us through. Um, I don't think we recognize his intimate involvement in everything that concerns us. And he says, "I, I won't keep you from it, but I will get you through it and I will hold your hand all the way to the end. That's intimacy. And that's what he offers. And so therefore, yes, we can laugh. And yes, we can refrain from making things awful. And yes, we can know that every day is a gift. But when they're over, they're over. But they're over at his command, not at something that we have done. I'm reminded of the visual pictures that we've seen lately since we're recording this around the time of all the disasters that are going on. And I've never seen one person who's been lifelined and flighted, flown out of an almost deadly situation. They cling to that rope as they are lifted. Isn't that the picture of how Christ, how we need to be with him? Absolutely. No, they're not just flailing their arms around and they're just not saying, woohoo, yay. Hi, everybody. (laughs) No, what they are doing is they're hanging on for dear life. And mm-hmm. and and they know that this is this is a true lifeline. And Christ is our true lifeline and you hang on for dear life. It is not it is not a party. It is not a celebration. It is a moment of intense awareness. Mm-hmm. This is my life. And sometimes we need to be brought back to that. Mm-hmm. That apart from him, we don't have a life. We we don't have an existence. And so, and with him, we have everything we need. So we need that reminder every now and then. Now, what do you do with the person or the circumstance where, you know, if my house were in a, were washed out to sea, I know in my head the sovereignty of God. And I know reality is I have no place to live. So there's a little bit of a a, a combat there mm-hmm. with the one who says he's going to carry me up is also the one who allowed my house to get wiped away. Right. That is the tension that we have mm-hmm. with the sovereignty of God. Because he, as Job, said, as Job said to his wife, can we accept good from God mm-hmm. and not accept the hard things? Mm-hmm. Can we? Because God is either sovereign in everything or he's just sovereign in the good things. And he's not, to quote your dad, just a little bit sovereign. He is a lot sovereign. I mean, he is all sovereign. And if he's only a little bit sovereign, then we have to pick and choose. Well, God was sovereign over that, but he's not sovereign over this. But if he's sovereign over our whole lives and the sovereign one who is the king who loves us, will provide. And yes, that house is gone, but we don't know what he will provide in the future. We don't know what he will take us through and what wonders he will show us. Mm -hmm. And just his presence is something that when people go through these kinds of things and they really trust in Christ, his presence is the most valuable, richest treasure Mm -hmm that they can possibly have. And that's what they will comment on. It is not on, well, God gave me another house. He may give you another house. He may not, but his presence will never, ever be forgotten. It's, it's worth it. 
It's interesting. I was talking with a friend of mine who's going through some health challenges as well. And she said, I just have never been a good patient. And I'm a terrible patient myself. Mm -hmm. I Anything over an hour for recovery is too long, <laughs> I think. So I've had to reframe that. And I said, go into it as being a learner. Mm -hmm. Or That's good. If, we have lo if we've lost everything, go into it as, who's the Lord going to bring to my life as I sleep in the middle of a coliseum of cots? Yes. Who will I meet that doesn't know him and doesn't have that kind of hope? Yes. Then it becomes an adventure rather than something to resist, to hate, to push away. But that, again, goes back to choice, doesn't it? It absolutely does. And what you think, I think we saw pictures from the Coliseum in Dallas, in Houston when mm. they there were people standing up and singing Amazing Grace. Think that was amazing. Yes. So you saw that. And, and it's yes. like, I thought. Oh, the presence of God is there and so real and they know it and they are expressing it. And I thought, what, what did that say to people who were marginalized and were sitting on the outside and were thinking, how can they sing? How can they sing when all of this is going on? And yet their faces were radiant and they were together as believers. And it was like, wow. You know, how can you sing in the midst of that? Well, there's only one way, and that it's if, if Christ is your life and death is your gain. That's the only way. That's right. That's right. And it is, you cover a lot on this one chapter that is very hard. It's on letting go. Oh, yeah. Your greatest longing is probably for the unwanted change not to be permanent. You cannot hang on to what no longer exists and still expect to live the life God has designed for you. Right. That is so powerful because we tend to say, okay, Lord, you took this away, but I want a house or I want this marriage right. or I want this healthy child right, or I want this job. And he says, no. Well, that's that may be permanent, and we have to let that go. Talk to us about how that process unfolds, because it is a process. It's totally a process, and it's again, it goes back to trusting God. That mm. is the, the underpinning of all of this. To get through any unknown season, you have to trust God. Trusting God, let's say you, you would want a perfectly healthy child. Well, of course, everybody would. But that's not what we get always. So if that's not what you get, then is God big enough to know what is best and how he will use the presence of this child in your life? Does he know that? And there, there was something I wrote in one of my books. It, I was just sitting down writing, okay, here's what I want to cover and this thought came to me, and it's really stuck with me ever since, and it, it's this, what might have been does not exist, so don't even go there. Okay, say that again. That's fabulous. What might have been does not exist, so don't even go there. What we do so often is we go to what might have been, and we live in a dream world of what might have been, but God doesn't deal in what might have been. He deals in what is. And mm -hmm. so when we get off into what might have been, then we get into the land of regret. And when we get into mm -hmm. regret, it pulls us down. That leads to depression. And then we get in that low grade place of if life had been different, then my life would be different. No, mm -hmm. your life is what God wants it to be. And he doesn't operate in what might have been. So he would not be there. He is here. He is in the present. He is very much involved in everything that is going on. He is not in what might have been. And so because of that, then we can come back to, okay, then I'll live in reality. It's, it's like truth, Colleen. It's, it's that mm -hmm. same thing of truth. You have to live in truth. You have to live in reality. You have to live in the now. And when you live in the now, you live in reality, you live in truth, 
That's where God is. And God is not anywhere else. He doesn't live anywhere else. And, when we and sometimes when we, st- when we live in what might have been and we want him to show up, he's not going to show up because he's not there. He's not there. No, he doesn't <laughs> live there. And he's not there. So, so it's You need like, to change your neighborhood. But how many people <laughs> do you know who live in that, and it's another shadow land, who live in yeah. that in that shadowed place of what might have been? Well, it's not. I often ask that question to audiences, what, what might have been. And they'll say, first one, first thing they come up with, if I'd married somebody else. Well, sure. you didn't. I mean, that's always the first one, which to me is, Usually the lights are down low. If I'd married someone else. <laughs> but I want to say to that, well, that was your choice. Yeah, I said, let's not you forget. Did. Yeah, but you did. <laughs> exactly right. Now, can God right. work in that? Yes, he can. Hmm. Hard as it is, maybe you did make a wrong choice. But no one can make a perfect choice. This is something else that I think is really important. Nobody can make a perfect choice because we don't know the future. So we have to make choices based on what we know at this moment. And then we have to trust God that he will cause it somehow to work together for our good because we love him. So the issue is loving God, not making perfect choices. Because who, when they're 17, 19, 22, 29, 30, 40, 70, can really make the right choice? You can't. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to do the will of God. Well, sure, everybody does. But how do you know what the will of God is? Well, you can to a point. The scripture, prayer, people encouraging you. But you know, I know a lot of people that have gone down that path and ended up in the worst situations you've ever seen. And they've said, but I thought it was the will of God. Well, you know what? The Bible says, um, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God concerning you. The will of God doesn't always look like the will of God. No, and also you said, um, because he promises it for our good. Right. Now, we must define what good means. Right. Because good is often so overshadowed with our human wants, our desires, our motivations, our what we didn't have as a child, what we wish could have, would have, should have been. Right. We have to say it's a good that we cannot see if we're trusting a God that we cannot see. see. Exactly. It is a good we can't see. We can't even define. We can't define the good because on a human basis, we don't know what that good is. With an eternal perspective, someday we'll know. Someday it will be all revealed. We'll know even as we're known. And we will know that that good really was good, but we'll know what it is. We can't define it now. Now, what was a situation that you went through possibly that you thought a good would come of it and it turned out totally different and you didn't like it, but you have now found it was good? Oh, wow. You know, as I look back, hmm, that's that's a hard one because... There are a lot of things that are still hanging in the air that have not come to fruition. You would think at 72, it would have come to fruition. (laughs) (laughs) But I can tell you, 72 is no different than 52 or 42 or 32. There is a lot that hangs in the air that you don't fully understand. And so Mm -hmm. as I look back, I think, oh, well, well, that didn't... uh, So... And I still question, but I have to come back to one thing. And that is, it's still hanging in the air now, but I'm not home yet. And when I get home, I'll look back and say, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. Yes. But, you know, I can tell you there's a, um, I met a woman at a a retreat in this. uh, They kept telling me, you've got to meet Betty. You've got to meet Betty. So I met Betty and she said, I said, Betty, everybody wants me to meet me to meet you. What's the story? And she said, well, my husband and my son um, were avid um, hunters and they went out hunting and my son slipped and the rifle shot my husband in back of the, the back of the head and killed him. And she said, he was a wonderful husband. We always had a life verse. He led us spiritually. He was a wonderful man. 
And so I was left with, I was a widow, my husband was dead, and I had to raise a son that I adored who had killed his father. And she said, I kept saying, Lord, why, why, Lord, someday I'll know. And she said, I finally came to the point where God and I just settled it. I didn't have to know. And someday I still might know. But when I saw my Savior, it wouldn't really matter. And she just left it at that. And I walked away and I thought, okay, that's trust. It really doesn't matter. And that also is very good because it puts us at peace exactly. with the craving for an answer right. to, I don't have to know. And what purpose is this for my life? How will God use this? But that is a process. And I do want to cover the chapter that you have on grief and hope. I love that you put this in there because there are a lot of misconceptions about grief. You know, oh, just get over it. Or, <laughs> oh, you're trying to get attention. Yeah, like that helps. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it doesn't help. And then it doesn't help to punch the person either. I, no, I don't neither advise one. that. But, no. <laughs> but you want to. Yeah. But you wrote, grief is one of those words we all believe we understand until we're in the middle of it. And then we only understand layers of revelation. Grief is often equated with sadness, but it's so much more. It's hurt. It's anxiety. It's darkness. Doubt. All rolled into one. Some days, uh, I'm sorry, and grief is a process. Grief does not does us no good unless there is an underlying understanding that someday things will get better. Grieving isn't the goal. Living is the goal. Now, unpack that for us. Grieving is not the goal. Grieving is the process to get to living again. And grieving is a process we have to go through because it, it our bodies have been so assaulted, our mind and our emotions have been so assaulted by loss mm -hmm. that it takes a while to catch up to a new normal. And that's what we're moving toward, a new normal. Things will never be like they were. And I think we it's important for us to say things will never be like they were. So that's a what might have been that needs to be put aside. However, there is a new normal, and that's where I'm headed. I'm headed toward a new normal, and but I'm not there yet. I'm not ready. You know, you hear people in grief, and they'll say, I'm just not ready for that. We need to let them not be ready. It's okay. Whatever a person in grief decides they're not ready for, we need to allow them and we need to allow ourselves not to go there. You don't have to do that. And so when we give permission for people to grieve, there's real freedom there. One of, one of the ways that we can know that grief is coming to a conclusion, because people say, well, how will I know when... I'm out of this grieving period will be the time when you are tired of talking about it. You will talk about things, talk about the hurt, talk about the ache, talk about the loss, talk about the separation, and it will go on and on. And you need, that's when we need friends who don't get tired of it, who will listen and they may get tired of it, but they don't tell us. And so they just, <laughs> yeah. they, just they just listen and listen. They nod. They nod and they say, I've heard this before, but go ahead and say it again. <laughs> But the wonder of it all is the day you wake up and you start to talk about it and it's like, I have no need to talk about it hmm. because I've said everything that needs to be said. That's when grief has been expunged. That's when the hmm. sorrow has been, the cup of sorrow has been drained and there's nothing left. There are no tears to cry. There's no more sorrow to pour out. There's no heaving over the loss. It's, it's done. Now there's a new normal. And you live in the new normal after you have finished the grief. And Now, I, I want to ask you about that because um, in my life, and there's a book called Necessary Losses by Judith Bjorst. She also wrote Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. I, I love her writing. 
I love her writing. And and yes, there are losses that are necessary for us to grow up so we are, don't become fully narcissistic and self-consumed. Right. I get that. But there are also families like mine who will have a living kind of grief. Um, my son won't go probably and get married. Mm-hmm. So every wedding, there's a sorrow in my heart. Right. But what I'm hearing you say is when the sorrow doesn't take me captive. Exactly. There's a sorrow, it, but it's a sorrow that you finally come to grips with. Mm-hmm. And when you come to grips with it, it doesn't take you captive. It's not something that you fully lament every time you you go to a wedding. You know, what happens in our brains, interestingly enough, is that when we have had a deep sorrow, if we rehearse it and mm-hmm. if we allow ourselves to go there, then we experience the same um, uh, release of negative hormones that were released the first time when you first had the sorrow. To recognize that is to know that to put yourself in that position over and over and over again is just to do damage. And so it's yes, to go to a wedding, but it's to go to a wedding recognizing that's their life. This is my son's life. God is just as involved in his life as he is in that life. And who is to say that weddings are the best thing that ever happens? Who is to say that marriage always works out? Who is to say that my <laughs> son has not been protected from that kind of sorrow? Right. And In fact, I, I love what you just said about the body, because the two words that you introduced me to that I've never heard before that are fascinating, which is psychoneuroimmunology right. and neuroimmunomodulation. <laughs> and I love that you tied in the fact that we are whole beings and when we allow the rumination on negatives, it lowers our immune system. Absolutely. It affects our endocrine system. It changes our pituitary glands, the hormones that are released. I mean, they're so, we are profoundly made. Yes. So, so for someone who is in a place where they, they can't see outside of the grief and they want to, and they don't want to have the drain on themselves physically and emotionally. What do you say to them today? First of all, I would say you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God knows how you're made and he knows your sorrow. But he also has given us many ways to walk out of that sorrow and live Because his desire for you in this life is to live. It is not for you to slowly die. And if you don't deal with sorrow, you will slowly die and wonder, where did that come from? And so it is making the choice. And it is, again, it's choice. It's Mm -hmm. making the choice. I'm going to live. Even if I don't feel like it, I will go ahead and do whatever I need to do to get to a new normal, to get to that point where I can live and recognizing I am making a choice against my body and against myself just as much as I was smoking a pack of cigarettes a day or if I were um, eating a pound of barbecue, (laughs) whatever. (laughs) A good Texas woman would say that. (laughs) A good Texas barbecue, maybe three pounds of barbecue. Versus there you one, go. Versus one pound. But but <laughs> but the, the choice is I am choosing against myself if I continue down this path. And the other question I think we have to ask is who is it helping for me mm-hmm. to maintain the sorrow? Because many people have in their head, if I will maintain the sorrow, then somehow, usually it's over the loss of a person. The person I have lost will know it. And they will know that I miss them. And that is such a lie from the enemy. It's like if it's it's like Queen Victoria who turned all the pictures to the wall and wore black for a year after or uh, the rest of her life, actually, after Albert died. And it's like Albert didn't know that. 
Albert didn't learn anything from that. But Queen Victoria just held on. And she died. Poor she son. probably died with this simple wardrobe. Yeah. Okay. It was all black. <laughs> Very simple wardrobe. But she probably died with dried up bones. Because it was yeah. like she did it to herself. And yeah. it's like, how much do we do to ourselves trying to prove to someone really what should have been said, spoken, proven in life? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I include in the book about say what you need to say. Yes, I loved that. And say everything you need to say before the end. So go ahead mm -hmm. and say it. And if you say all that and there's nothing left to say when people leave and you say, well, they were taken suddenly, say it today. Say it before they're taken, because we never know what will happen tomorrow. Hmm. And if you take care of those things, then as you experience this, you will say, well, I said everything I needed to say. I have nothing to prove. I have nothing to prove. He knew that I loved him. She knew that I loved her. And I, I had no more words to give her. Hmm. And that comes back around to... God provides. Not only does he know yeah. or care, but he provides even to the last moment when we cannot provide for ourselves. Exactly. And he will he 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 never leaves us without his provision. Right. We usually leave him wanting to, him to agree with our provision. Exactly. <laughs> Lord, I need and, this. Yes. Um I as I close and I want to challenge our audience with this as well. I came across um something that Jack Canfield had started which is to throw a party. Um come dressed as you will be in 5 years. Oh, I love and it. And he's Isn't that cool? Yeah. He has them dress up as you will be in 5 years. Where do you think you will be in 5 years? Oh, wow. Well, let's see. I'll be 77. Hopefully I'll be pretty much where I am now, I probably just won't be traveling as much be uh -huh. because it's a hassle. But um, <laughs> but I hope I hope to write another book. Um, I swore when I wrote this book, I'd never write another one. But as soon as it was finished, I thought, well, I have a few more things to say. So hope to write another book. And in those five years, I hope I've learned enough to write another book. And um I hope I hope I know God better than I do now. Mm -hmm. And I hope I trust mm -hmm. him more. And I hope we're even closer friends so that when I step into his presence, that it's like old friends have mm -hmm. just seen each other. We just saw each other yesterday and here we are today. So I, I hope it's like that. That would be my goal. I hope I get to see you before five years passes. <laughs> you know what? We'll plan on it. I mean, we're not going to let five years go, Colleen. This has been. I rich. just want to. I just want to thank you so much for reminding us all that there are unknown seasons we will encounter. Yes. It's inevitable. I don't care how well you plan or how strong you think you are something's going to happen that brings us into the unknown. Yes. And yet you bring us to, to mind. God knows. God cares. God provides. And I would add, and he loves each one of us with a profound sense of love. We just need to open ourselves up to it. Absolutely. How can people find you, Jan, even though you're all over the internet and traveling all over the nation? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, www, I guess we still do you say that. Jan yep. Silvius, S I L V I O U S dot com. I'm right there. Any last words that you want to say to who to those who are listening? I think you summed it up so well, Colleen, when you said we all will face unknown seasons. It is a universal issue. And just simply to say they don't have to be dreaded just because they're unknown we don't have to fear because god is waiting right there in the midst and we can trust him mm -hmm.